Thank you very much for still being here. We're going to keep you, uh, well, ideally awake is my brief, so keep, keep you awake and hopefully keep you a bit inspired. I've, we've got this terrific panel of speakers talking about how we're going to get to uh, the 2030 goals and what we think we need to do to get there. So uh, I will start with some introductions. So the uh, man on my extreme left there, in, well, he's not on my extreme left, sort of moderate left. Uh, <laughs> in, uh, <laughs> is uh, is uh, Richard Angel, who became the chief executive of the Terence Higgins Trust in March 2023, um, and requires no real introduction to everyone else in this room, so I'll keep it fairly brief, uh, if that's okay. But I, I think we should all thank Richard for putting on this fantastic day today. <laughs> Moving along, we've got Adam Winter, who uh, is absolutely key at the Department of Health and Social Care and was absolutely instrumental in getting the first HIV plan over the line and delivering that so we can have a second HIV plan, which we'll be talking about today. Uh, so welcome to Adam. Uh, James Walgart is the uh, current SRH and HIV con commissioning lead in Liverpool and chair of the English HIV and Sexual Health Commissioners Group at national level. So that group feeds into the voice of local authority leads in national policy and aims to support local leads with best practice examples. And James is also the chair of Fast Track Cities Partnership in Liverpool. So welcome to James. <laughs> I'm afraid I'm going to have to use my notes because I don't know everyone all that well. <laughs> so we've got Professor Claudia Escort, who is... <laughs> Shall I do it? You could do it if you like, yeah. So, um, yes, you could do it, actually. Yes, you Good know, I seem to have not everyone. been given a bite. I'm Professor of Sexual Health and HIV in Glasgow. I also work in London, and I'm representing BASH today. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I should never work with bits of paper. Uh, <laughs> uh, let's go down to uh, Christina on the end there. So, Christina is the Senior Policy Officer at NAS, a sexual health and HIV charity that's a member of the One Voice Network, and you'll hear from One Voice Network today. Her work focuses on developing practical interventions to address uh, health disparities rooted in structural racism and discrimination. So that's Christina Ganatakis. Uh, Sinead. Sinead Ward is from Vive UK and uh, is the general manager. Started her career in the pharmaceutical industry nearly 19 years ago. Uh, she worked for multiple companies, including GSK, Novartis, and AbbVie, in diverse leadership roles and in diverse therapy areas, including diabetes, oncology, and most recently HIV. Uh, and is now the general manager for Vive UK. Thank you. And then we have Rachel Hill Tout, who I've deliberately left last because Rachel has the misfortune to have to work with me all the time. <laughs> uh, and Rachel is the uh, is, it has so many jobs that even I lose track sometimes. So Rachel is an HIV consultant and now a GP as well and is the national lead uh, clinically for the opt-out testing program in England. So it's Rachel. <laughs> and I should probably say who I am for it uh, as well. So I'm Ian Jackson. I'm the national advisor to the opt-out testing program. I sit on Fast Track Cities uh, London, and I'm a uh, contracts and planning director in my slightly more boring job in specialised commissioning in NHS England as well. So thank you to everyone, and thank you for still being here. And let's get on with this important topic of how do we get to 2030, what we're going to need to do. So what I'm going to do is go through the panel in turn, and I'm going to start with Christine. And I'm going to ask, uh, what is it you think we need to do to get to our 2030 goals? And I'm going to give everyone a couple of minutes just to talk about that. And then I want a particular focus at the end on what you think you can do as an individual, which might or might not be related to what you're telling us about what we need to do collectively. And as we go through that, I'd really like everyone to get an idea of the sense of there is enormous power in this room. There's, there's quite a lot of power on the stage, but every single person in here is here because they've got some power in our fight in getting to 2030. Mm -hmm. And I really want to focus on not just what organisationally we could do, but what we can do as individuals to help us get there. So everyone, uh, everyone to, to go first. But Christine, I'll hand over to you. Thank you very much. Um, it's really wonderful to be here with you all. Um, so for those of you that aren't aware of what One Voice Network does, we're an intimate, in, independent collaborative of 12 black-led organizations focusing on HIV care and support for black communities across the UK. And there are four things that I want um, all of us to think about as we work towards the 2030 goal. And so the first thing is to act on the data. 
um, across the social determinants, black, African, and Caribbean communities in the UK have the poorest outcomes. This is nothing new. If you look at a UK HSA epidemiology report, the numbers have not lied over the years. And yet we haven't really acted in an intentional way um, specific to these communities that have been disproportionately affected by HIV. We need to become comfortable with the uncomfortable and start addressing the, stu the structural barriers like racism and discrimination that continually perpetuate these outcomes. Every organization here needs to focus on the communities that we have been talking about for years. Our communities aren't experiencing the same prevention gains of, uh, as other population groups, but we know that the kinds of interventions that work, such as targeted, culturally specific, and intersectional, are the ones that will have the most impact. If we don't work in this way, we'll continue to see an apartheid of outcomes. We need to be intentional about the way that we finance our work. We need to ring fence our funding. We need to focus on the disproportionately impacted communities. And we need to implement redistributive justice in the way that we work. The second aspect that I want us to focus on is normalizing HIV testing and prevention across uh, historically overlooked communities. Now, this is something that we're already doing. Um, but we need to focus on it more in those dis disproportionately impacted communities, specifically black African and Caribbean, migrant and asylum seekers, people who inject drugs, um, folks who um, uh, uh, are, are, have substance mis uh, work with subs substance misuse, um, mental health and the like. We've seen the shift in public attitudes over the decades that have come from successful public health campaigns, and our work should continue to push this forward in communities that aren't our reach, but have been historically overlooked. We need to be asking the communities most at risk, what are their challenges, and what do they think the solution is? Co-production and in co-producing interventions that address these disproportionate outcomes are what we need to ensure that people are engaged and stay engaged. The third aspect I want us to think about is scaling up these good practices. The answer to ending HIV transmissions doesn't lie within just the sector. As black and global majority led organizations, we're constantly working in ways that disrupt the status quo. We should continue to explore partnerships outside of the sector to scale and amplify our efforts. Our work, not just One Voice Network, but the community led organizations that intersect with the wider social determinants and complex lived experiences of our service users and communities, such as migrants and asylum seekers, um, once again, folks who, uh, who uh, substance misuse, mental health and housing. Uh, these are all of the aspects that we need to look at cross-sectorally so that we can ensure that we're, uh, we're working together uh, to achieve better health outcomes. Are enough, of, are enough of us in the sector working in a multidisciplinary way? This is a question that we really need to start asking ourselves. We know that HIV isn't a single issue story, so it doesn't require a single issue solution. And the final thing that I want us to focus on, um, or the final thing that I want to, um, to, 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 to stress, um, is that we need to develop a strategic focused health plan that focuses the next, that's focused on the next five years on black African and Caribbean communities. This isn't a taboo, this isn't, an, this isn't something that we should shy away from. We know what the numbers have said over the years and it's time for us to act in a way that's according to what the numbers are telling us. Our communities, as do many others, have complex and intersecting needs, and we know that the mixed methods of engagement work in black, brown, Latin American, and global majority communities. We know that they can cost more, but we know that the benefits are, the, ben the benefits are there. So we need to increase investment into those communities who need it the most. We need to embrace the tenets of the Black Lives Matter movement. We need to work in a way that's anti-racist. We need to work in a way that uplifts the communities that are underserved and have been historically overlooked. If we all signed up to center the communities who carry the highest burden of the worst health outcomes, I do believe that we can make 2030 a reality. Yeah, that's, uh, yeah, that's going to be tricky to follow. Sorry, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to pause because that was amazing. It was fantastic. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Christina. Thank you. That was amazing. It is a hard act to follow. Mm. Um, but I think what I have to say does echo a lot of your points. And it's actually, although intimidating to follow on from, it's actually, I, I think it does follow quite nicely. Um, I want to talk about opt-out testing, and I want to talk about that in the, in the broadest sense. If we think about 2030 goals, in my mind, the two things that we really have to tackle is we must scale up and expand HIV testing. And as you said, Christina, we must move outside our sector. We must move outside traditional testing practices, places of testing. We have to do that. But secondly, and I think 
almost as important as that, is not just about testing, it is about addressing stigma, racism, and homophobia that makes many of our healthcare institutions unsafe for people living with HIV, whether they're diagnosed or not. And that is reflected in our, you know, ongoing high levels of late diagnosis. It's still 40%, it's not acceptable. And we are still seeing people presenting at extremely late stages of infection. So to be very simple, our testing paradigm needs to change. We have achieved so, so much to get us here, and we should be extremely proud of where we are in the UK in terms of our HIV testing outcomes. But what has got us here will not get us to 2030. We have to change the paradigm, and we have to move outside of the HIV and the sexual health sector. We have to move into frontline healthcare settings. Part of the reason I made a move from sexual health, HIV, into GP is exactly for that reason. We have to sit in uncomfortable rooms, talking to busy generalists, and, and make the case for why literacy in HIV and sexual health is so important. Now, testing is a very important part of prevention, which I'm going to talk a bit more about, but there's other aspects. But we have to be in that space, and we have to change the paradigm of testing. So opt-out testing, as we've seen, has been a phenomenal success, and it's been such a privilege to be part of this. We now have 34 sites in the first wave who are live with HIV testing. We've got another 47 who are being funded, and, and this will triple our capacity for opt-out testing. In only two and a half years, we've delivered over 2.2 million HIV tests. We found 870 new diagnoses, and there's way over 85% rapid linkage to care for, for people who are newly diagnosed. We're also finding people who've been uh, disengaged from care, lost to care, despite having a previous diagnosis. It is clearly effective. We, we really need to think about what, do, what can we take from this to, to move forward? It is, it is amazing that we've got further funding for another 47 sites. But when we think about it, what we've really shown is that with a powerful community voice, with very strong partnerships, first with the community, but also with UKHSA, with our hepatitis colleagues who've allowed us to incorporate hepatitis B and C testing, we've achieved something that is really beautifully simple. There's a lot of work behind mm. it, but we now have a model that yeah, works yeah. in these very high prevalence settings. We must, we must push to continue this, and we've got an amazing <coughs> opportunity with a, with a new HIV action plan coming up. Clearly, this must continue in the highest prevalence areas, but we must also take that model of partnership and collaboration and centering the community voice and think, how can we expand to other frontline settings, like general practice, like contraception clinics, to address groups that are not being served well by current testing strategies, as you said, women, black African communities. We must move out of our comfort zone into those areas. So I think we can do that. We, we've shown that it works. There isn't a one-size-fits-all, but I think we can take those lessons of why this has been successful uh, and move it out further. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. That's great. Um, so, Sinead, from a pharmaceutical industry point of view, mm -hmm. how do you think you can support us, and, and what do you think is needed from your perspective? Yeah. Um, so, just for anyone who doesn't know, so Vive Healthcare is a company that is 100% focused on HIV. So that is our only priority, and so we, we don't take that lightly. So obviously our focus is around continuing to innovate in terms of new treatments for people who could um, benefit from PrEP or people who have HIV. Um, and I genuinely am you know, really privileged to, to be sitting here because we, we really feel that we can play a part in helping to support the 2030 goals. Because we know that with new treatments um, and new um, options for prevention, obviously the more choice people have, hopefully the more people we can reach. But there's probably a few things that I would say, and one of the main things I would say is around, I suppose, equitable access to not just treatments, because I'm a pharmaceutical uh, representative, but to prevention services generally. So a lot of people have already spoken about this today, but actually we need more touch points where people can access prevention services because we know that there are a myriad of reasons why they may not feel comfortable going into a sexual health service, for example. Um, and I know as um, a company and in partnership with, with Gilead, this is why we decided to, to co-fund um, along with um, EJAF, who co-funded and are leading a project really looking about access to PrEP um, to underserved communities and really trying to, I suppose, have a bit of a blueprint to help commissioners have the evidence to scale up. But once you get people into those services, actually then it's the conversation about the choices that are available to them 
not just the choices that they may know about, not just the choices that people may assume are going to be the right choices for them. I don't think we can assume every person is the same, one size fits all. Contraception is a great example of that. You know, there are so many different options because actually one size doesn't fit all. But we're really relying on people having those conversations, really telling people what their options are so that they can make an informed decision um, that is right for them. And I suppose last is around, I suppose, HIV education. Um, so what can we do as an industry to support the education um, around HIV prevention um, so that people can empower themselves to make the right decisions? And one of the things, I suppose, thinking about what we're doing as Vive, we're looking at the moment around how we can learn from our US colleagues. Um, so today in one of the sessions, there was actually a conversation about risk and how we need to reframe the word risk. Um, and our US colleagues had a campaign called Risk to Reasons. And this was a educational campaign. It was focused on black women. Um, and it was around really trying to empower those women to make the choices that were right for them. And it was around reframing the risk of engaging in what could be perceived as risky behavior, but actually then kind of making an informed decision and empowering yourself to make the right decision about what's, what's needed from a HIV prevention perspective. So we're looking at whether or not we can take the learnings from the US right now to support everyone in terms of um, HIV um, prevention education. Um, but we're also looking to see if we can not just provide those materials to people who could benefit, but also maybe healthcare professionals who are in those different settings that you mentioned, you know, so that then actually when there's an opportune moment, they might have a HIV prevention discussion um, rather than in the sexual health service. Thank you. Okay, Claudia, what do, you, what do you think? To get to 2030. Elimination of HIV transmission can really only be achieved by strong collaboration, underpinned by appropriate resource. And quite simply, we're not only better together, we will only achieve our goal together. Success will rely on four key areas, intelligence, interventions, individuals, and impact. For intelligence, we do need ongoing detailed understanding of the pandemic, particularly as the numbers of new acquisitions fall. And this will allow us targeting of resource where it's most needed. Crucially, we need the expertise of people with lived experience and NGOs to help us understand the stories behind the numbers. We need excellent research to guide us with evidence rather than opinion because there is no longer any place for rhetoric. We don't have the time and we don't have the money. When we try new things, which we should, we must evaluate them because investment in evaluations are saving down the line. Interventions, we need to harness our skills and work together across community, clinicians, public health, commissioners, academics, to develop evidence-based, and yes, you've heard it so many times, co-created interventions. And we must tailor our tools for different groups, particularly for those who've yet to see the benefits of game changers such as PrEP. And we need to know that this may well mean a different mix of interventions or weighting of them for different people at different times in different places. We need to create new interventions, but not forget the old ones. Partner notification still exists. Are we doing it well enough? Let's challenge ourselves to do it better. Individuals, as individual healthcare providers, we must offer and encourage testing for HIV and discuss prevention in culturally sensitive ways, providing the highest quality care to the person in front of us without forgetting that we are missing out on opportunities for all those people who have yet to engage. Some people will largely be able to self-manage, but others will need a lot of specialist and culturally sensitive support to get the best deal for them for HIV prevention. We need time and we need skilled staff, and this needs resourcing. Finally, impact. We must evaluate every intervention, every new service model, measuring the things that matter to service users. 
we must acknowledge we won't always get it right first time and we should learn from failures as well as successes and go on to do it better. We need to accept that it will cost more to keep some people free of HIV than others. But as long as we target our resources appropriately, such as by providing more expensive interventions to those who have missed out or those who really need them, we can truly make HIV prevention more equitable. Together we have the tools, together we have the commitment, we already have the relationships and we have the tenacity. But we need cohesion and we need a plan. BASH calls for a national sexual health strategy underpinned by appropriate resource to make sure that nobody is left behind. Thank you. Uh, I think everyone agreed. Um, so let's, uh, let's move on to James. So from a, a sexual health commissioner's point of view. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, wow. Uh, follow, follow that. Um, I mean, I've got, I might, uh, forgive me, I might dip in and out of quite a few things. There's, there's, a, lot, there's a lot to cover, but I, I would like to go down the same sort of route that I think you know, that this, this has been inspiring today, truly inspiring to see so many people talking about equity and, and making sure that everyone gets the, the same access, uh, which is absolutely vital. So I would equally go down the, the collaboration route, the, the partnership route. Um, feels to me like this, that that's got to continue. I see that in Liverpool a lot at the moment. We see it with other areas of the country, Manchester and other places in London, lots of partners around the table talking about how we make this, how, how we make this, this you know, 2032 target a, a reality. Um, and in terms of, uh, I think that, that that's got to continue to, to, to happen. There are many partners involved in this, commissioners, clinicians, you know, providers, um, obviously um, people with lived experience. There's a lot going on and we need to make sure we invest in that properly and make it work properly. That is where I think the USP for the English Commissioners Group can be here. Um, we are a, you know, a network of, of uh, commissioners up and down the country. <coughs> I think it's our message, certainly my role, my ambition, to make sure that everyone comes at this from the same point of view and that all commissioners are supporting services and are funding them properly if we can. Um, but th th there's, there's, there's a challenge there, obviously. Um, but I think building on what Kevin uh, and Minister Gwynne said this morning, uh, I just think it's about being brave. I think you've just said it, Claudia. Um, the, 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 there's a lot that we can do, I think, around PrEP, equity, um, <coughs> that's embracing these new technologies. There are injectables coming. They may be challenging to bring, bring into the market to move out of the typical clinic-based services, but I think we need to provide as much access to that as possible. Um, it's an exciting time. There are various trials that we've heard about today. You know, the Brighton Emerge online app, um, Bristol, you know, the feasibility around pharmacy. There's all these opportunities that I think are gonna, going to get us there, ultimately. Um, but just to say something maybe slightly different, um, I'm really proud of, of the commissioning that we've got going on in Liverpool and in other areas in Manchester. Uh, I just think that, that, that the bit we perhaps haven't covered so far is, is that peer support element. Um, the, the, as we move more towards you know, the, uh, identifying uh, people living with HIV and, and there, are, there are no new cases, that sort of engagement and re-engagement in care um, is, is a big thing. We commission a peer support service and an intensive support service. And I think all of that complexity needs to come into it to make sure that we've, we've covered everybody and that uh, you know, we, we reach the goal ultimately um, and commission some, some different innovative things as well around uh, you know, sort of secondary prevention, uh, formula milk, you know, HIV formula milk, and so on. I think it's all, there's, there's, a, there's a lot that we can still do. Um, and I, I think, you know, in terms of, um, we've done, a, English commissioners have just recently done a piece of work understanding um, people, um, in terms of PrEP access, uh, up and down the country, barriers uh, and um, facilitators, awareness raising, many people telling us they didn't even know it was available. Uh, an empowerment piece around prep for women to bring women in on, on prep as well. I think there's so much that we could be doing to reach the target. Um, and I think from, from a mission point of view, from an English commissioner's perspective, um, we're, we're going to run more master classes and try and make sure that commissioners are, are up on this and understand uh, where we need to be and what we need to do here. So I'll probably, probably leave it there. But uh, Thank you. Okay. Adam. 
Yeah, thanks. Um, so, yeah, how to follow all of that. I agree with a huge amount of what the, the panel's already said. Um, I think what Christina said about um, how uh, we need to work with communities and really address those intersectionalities, I think, is absolutely crucial. And I think that's a real challenge for us. Um, it has been in, in sort of national policy making, so really keen to see us improve that. Um, really uh, agree with what Rachel said on um, improving the literacy of uh, generalists on HIV. I think that's going to be really, really important. And I, I also think um, what Claudia said about good working relationships really being um, at the heart of how we're going to get there. We work in, all of us work in such a complex environment. It's hugely complex nationally, big organizations, sometimes with slightly confusing responsibilities. Hmm. Then all the systems below that, we've got regions, we've got cities, we've got metro areas, we've got ICBs, we've got local authorities. Um, you know, some of which are coterminous, some of which aren't. It's that that is quite a, a soup of things to, to kind of wade through. Um, so to try and bring, um, from a national perspective, to try and bring as much clarity of that um, to um, the next action plan, I think is going to be really important. And for me, one of the areas that the previous action plan really, really didn't talk to enough was that national to local to regional um, uh, sort of picture um, and how can, uh, from a national perspective, can we support and encourage um, local areas as much as possible while also respecting that, that local autonomy. Um, I also really want to uh, highlight the importance and the, the, one of the critical success factors, I think, in, in England and the UK is the excellent work of UK Health Security Agency um, and, and sexual health clinics across the country on our world leading data and epidemiology um, without UK Health Security Agency um, and the work they do. Yes, thank you. Round of applause for UK to say. You know, that, as I say, that is really one of our critical success factors. Um, so I think, you know, supporting them is, is, is really important. Um, and uh, I'd also say, you know, resources is, you know, it's a... Expectations are high of the new government. Um, the Chancellor and the Prime Minister, I think, has been pretty clear that we are in a, a tricky uh, financial situation, uh, certainly for the next couple of years. So I think, um, you know, f what I can commit to from a national level is, is to be honest with you all on that and to have frank conversations and to sort of involve partners as much as possible if there is some difficult prioritization ahead. Um, I think in terms of other things, uh, one of the ideas that we've had, um, which I'm sort of announcing now, is um, the, I, I know, get excited, um, is the potential for a new fifth objective in the new action plan, which could cover maybe some of the wider system issues that we weren't uh, able to cover in the previous action plan, um, to, look at, to look at services, to look at how we can support them more effectively, to look at education, and to um, hopefully look at some of those workforce issues, uh, because I think the HIV workforce, the GUM workforce, other colleagues, CSRH, which obviously supports um, sexual health services, nursing, you know, all of that is uh, absolutely critical to achieve in 2030. So I would like us to, uh, to look at that as well. So, yeah, that's it. From me. Thank you very much. And Richard, I think you might have a view on this topic. Uh, one or two. Um, <laughs> So I'm going to try and focus on some things that I think are things that we should be trying to get in the action plan that really uh, address the health equity point that has uh, gone through uh, the kind of panel here, like a stick of Blackpool Rock. I think this is the, the theme of the conference and our objective today. So if you take across some of the, the, the themes we want to work across on prevention, I think we're not going to get where we need to on PrEP unless you can at least dispense, if not prescribe, from pharmacy. If it's not really accessible in the community or there isn't a kind of national social health clinic that can, through an online service, distribute PrEP around the country, we really aren't going to get those who are health literate out of the appointments that we need to get them out of and the capacity to get people in front of communities where we need to. And colleagues are here from Brighton where we've seen exactly that model through the PrEP Emerge app releasing capacity to go into communities to do an outreach clinic for sex workers, trans communities, people of colour, migrants, like exactly what we need to be doing. We should do that nationally. Uh, finding those who are undiagnosed, we've got to get opt-out testing now into uh, GP surgeries in high prevalence areas. That is absolutely where we will intervene in the health pathway of those most likely to be undiagnosed and, and those that would never otherwise get to a GUM uh, clinic or facility uh, to make that happen and I'd like to obviously see opt-out testing rolled out uh, in all of those 47 that have got the funding that would be nice um, in itself for them to spend that money that we fought so hard uh, for them to get um, and obviously for that funding to be multi-year 
I think we've got a lot of work to do on helping those who are newly diagnosed or new to the UK with HIV and making sure there is really good peer support and peer-led work to make sure people can come to terms with a HIV diagnosis, and that includes counselling support and being around others living with HIV. I think for those lost to care, we've got to have a voluntary sector led uh, with honorary contracts in the NHS way of reaching out to those that are not going to their appointments. We literally have a list of who those people are. Like, we don't have enough doctors and nurses in this country, and if you wanted to go about doing it, it takes years and years to train them up. We have a vibrant voluntary sector that could step into much of that work and do those phone calls from tomorrow. On uh, stigma, we've got a lot of work to do uh, across the board, and I think we need to do part of the action plan should be looking at that going forward uh, and really doing some concerted effort to try and make a dent on a national level uh, on stigma because the truth is we haven't talked out to the country as a whole country since the adverts went out in the late 80s. Um, workforce, I think, is really important, but there's lots of things we need to do, and Adam's talked about addressing some of them. But I went to BASH conference a couple of months ago, and I was in a session about talking to your patients about sex, and less than half of the clinicians in the room actually talked to their patients or their service users about the sex they were having. They might have checked off a, who do you have sex with? But that was basically the start and the end of the conversation of the sex that they were having. And by definition, if they were at BASH conference, they are the better half of those sexual health conditions, right? <laughs> the ones I worry about, the ones who don't go to BASH conference, right? So if we can't talk about sex when you are a, a, a sexual health clinician, what chance have we got that GPs are doing it, let alone anyone in A&E? But if you look through those social determinants of health, on every single one, whoever's come up with it and done their own diagram or their own thing, sex, this, who you have sex with is clearly a determinant of that thing. But it's always the bit that gets missed off. And finally, I'd say, as uh, speaking as somebody from the voluntary sector, not as on behalf of it, is we need to be there in 2030. We've seen really pivotal organisations close this year in the HIV sector, not least AIDS MAP, and the amazing work that we know they did on treatment advocacy, and we will miss them being part of the HIV family. Others, you know, I've been open about the challenges we've had at THT and how we've had to half the size of our organisation to be able to stay focused and be here and to try to do what we can to end new cases by 2030 and make that impact on equity. And partly because we've been so open about it, some of my colleagues, some are in the room, some are not, have been quite open with me about the challenges that they're having. And tr in truth, we are really struggling as a sector and if people value us around the table, they need to fund us to be there. And often the expectation is not just that we're cheap, but often you can get what we get, what we give for free. And the truth is it all costs uh, money. So uh, that's my Thank you. So, so brilliant speeches all. And I'm, I'm kind of struck by a couple of things that I think are true at the same time. And the first one is I'm just going to say it out loud, and I, I don't think I've got any NHS England comms colleagues to tell me I can't say stuff today, which they, they like to do quite a lot. But, I, but we're not going to get there if we do what we're doing today. <coughs> so we have, a we have a 2030 national deadline, and we all know that in the room, and I don't want people to forget that, because we're, we're all talking about brilliant things. There are brilliant things that everyone in this room is involved in. So there is a kind of harnessing of that collective power. And we, have to, we do see it. So I, I don't want to be sort of relentlessly negative about this, because actually something like the opt-out testing programme, that you know, there's, there's a few of us who work at NHSE who are here who work on it. But actually, there's probably a 1,000 people working on that project. Every single site has got people working on it who are only paid as part of their regular day job to work on it. And yes, we've managed to integrate bits of peer support, and we've touched on some of the bits we've done today. But there is, there is a magic in HIV that is not there in other places that I think if you just do HIV every day you can sort of forget which is that you have the best story in modern medicine now obviously it didn't start like that mm. it, it's, but, but because it didn't start like that because it comes from that dark place it's now a hopeful place and it's something that we can coalesce around and I've spent a lot of time talking to people in uh, you know, other countries both you know both developing world countries, I'm, I'm talking to Pretoria, who are thinking about doing opt-out testing for hepatitis, because they don't even know how much hepatitis they've got in the country. Um, but also, I was talking to the Robert Koch Institute, which is the German equivalent of Public Health, what Public Health England used to be what UXA is now, and they cannot believe what we're doing in opt-out testing. 
they were sitting there going, we need to do this in every city, but actually they need to change the law first. So my answer is, well, change the law then. So at the, at the same time, we are not going to get there. We're still being looked at as a genuine world leader, and that's, that isn't true. I think it's fair to say, Adam, it's not true of every single aspect of our health system. <laughs> so, so, but, but for HIV, we are, we, are, we are looked at as this kind of this powerhouse, and I want us to be able to tap into that. So, that, so I'm going to do my follow-up question, which is the same question to all of you, which is in order to, t to tap into that, what can we do as individuals to get there? And again, I'm going to go, I'm going to go from Christina down, down the panel to go, what are you as an individual? Because at the moment, you know, I, reflecting on what you said, Christina, we're not avowedly anti-racist in all the work we do. Some, you know, we, I think we want to be, but there's something that kind of almost holds us back from just going, no, we are going to do this in an anti-racist way. We are going to acknowledge the fact that we are dealing with populations who the services, and I, you know, talking about the NHS, the NHS kind of quite often sets up services in a way that suit the NHS and don't suit the public that it serves. So how do, we, how do we change that? And what as an individual, because that's the takeaway that I want everyone to get, we carry on this fight, we will get there. We, we, we carry on, we, we work out the things that work really well and we, we will get there. But what can we do as individuals is, is what I'd like to get out of the rest of the session. So Christine. So I think as individuals, um, I think the first thing is to just reflect on the bias that you have um, all of us are born with, or I rather, we're not born with a bias, but bias is learned. And so before, it, it starts when you're very young. And I think trying to, you know, nip it in the bud as early as possible. So whether that's having conversations with the young people in your life, um, if you work with young people, having that conversation at an earlier point. Um, and then as you get older, you know, talking with, with your friends and your family in a way that normalizes um, the... Um, uh, the need to have this kind of conversation. If you were to ask me uh, what I think is, is maybe like the biggest barrier, um, coming from Canada where colonization is something that's talked about um, very openly, it's not a conversation that I think is, is, is had here. And I think when you reflect on the colonial history of your country and the way that your services are set up, um, then you realize that the people that are, are you know, disproportionately affected are the ones that, um, you know, were on the butt end of, of the colonial history. And so the moment that you can... <laughs> so I think the moment that you start to recognize it and you start to act on it, you need to name it. You need to name the issue. Um, and so starting from that, that, that point um, and then working to, um, to be anti-racist in the way that you work. Um, th I think that's really how it, how it begins. Yeah. So that's my answer. Thank you. And Rachel, what, what, are, what are you going to do? And are you going to continue to work with me? I hope you are. <laughs> um, if you're not, this is a really embarrassing place. To <laughs> we're going to have this, yeah, yeah, have this yeah, yeah. conversation. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think it's a really good question. I like the way you phrased it. What are you going to do about it? Because I think we all have to ask ourselves, what are we going to do? I mean, it's easy to push back and say, the government should do this, the system should do this. But actually, when, if I think about it myself as a clinician, there is so much that has been achieved by clinicians, by teams, by partnerships to get testing and prevention efforts up and, up and running. Part of the reason we have this amazing OCTAP testing strategy now is because of the community partnerships. And it is also because dedicated clinicians and teams on the ground bang their heads against a wall for years and years and years, and they worked out the pathways, they got funding, they scrabbled, to, they scrabbled together a way of doing it, and they worked out the SOPs. And that allowed us, when we finally got the funding, thanks to the lobbying of THT and the, all, all of the community sector that made this possible, we were ready to go. And this is because people did not give up. We have had opt-out testing and guidance for nearly a decade now, but it is people who persevered and said this is clearly the right thing to do. People are at risk, people are dying unnecessarily of HIV, they're being diagnosed late, and people started taking action on the ground. And there's pioneering clinics, I could name so many, who said no matter what, even if there isn't national funding, we are going to do this. And so I think it's beholden to us all to say it is the right thing. We can't just say, oh, it's very difficult and there's not enough money and it's, it's all very hard. We have to say it can be done. We have to say it is the right thing. We have to reach out to our partners who are ready and willing to, to work with us. And we have to just take action and get on and do it. Because we have, we have seen that if you can demonstrate good practice, 
you can develop a model that, that works, then when funding does finally become available, you can take that and run with it. And we have such an opportunity now. So we have to keep going. We have to hang on in there. We have to keep talking. We have to keep meeting. We have to keep, you know, we have to keep at it. And I think back to your, your point, Christina, it, it's not just about, I'm talking about testing, but it's not just about testing. Testing is a way in, particularly thinking about frontline healthcare settings and generalists, it is a way into the conversation about HIV literacy, about talking about sexual health, about sexual hi histories, about intimacy. We need these conversations to be happening in order to address the, the racism, the inequalities, the stigma that is, that is behind all of this. So testing is one way in. And I'd just like to share an anecdote from, um, we have a lot of our meetings about HIV optate testing on a Friday. I heard this amazing story from Orla McQuillan that many of you may know in Manchester. She set up this fantastic HIV stigma module in Manchester, and it was really difficult to get uptake amongst the clinicians. She had about a few hundred people doing it. And as a result of the phenomenal success of their opt-out testing project there, they now have about 7,000 hits on their module. So this is why it's important. We have to keep talking about it. We have to keep pushing pushing opportunities to have these conversations, getting out of our safe spaces into areas where people may not be talking about HIV, may not be talking about testing. And so this, this is a great opportunity. So I think as a clinician, that is what I'm gonna keep doing. I'm a practicing GP. I make it my business whenever I'm doing blood tests for tiredness, for diarrhea, for feeling a bit off color, for tingly hands. I say, well, we're gonna do a routine HIV test along with all the other ones. And I have not had one person say no. They say, oh, fabulous, that's great. Not one person. And I see, as I'm doing it, it is a great delight to me that I see my colleagues starting to do it. If you start doing good practice, you will see people doing that. Thank you. Just, just linking this in terms of personal power. So the first time mm. I met Rachel was on a Teams call. And it was when opt-out testing became a thing. And I'd already determined if opt-out test when, when I got the news that the money had come through, and I didn't know that was happening, when the money came through, I was in the post-COVID world. I'd been in critical care for London in, uh, in the pandemic. It was horrible. And I sort of figured that, right, there's a, there's a program here that the clinicians have all told me they want to do. I'm, I'm going to do that. I'm, I'm doing that. No one else gets so personal. Parents, I'm doing this. And then I saw, see Rachel, the first time I've ever met her. She went, hi, I'm a clinician. I want to work on opt-out testing. I'm not leaving. <laughs> <laughs> that, is per, that is personal power for both of you, right? and we are, we are working on this program. When I, when, I, when I tell you you have power in this room, you really do, and the more we link together, the more that stuff happens. Yeah. Janae, what are you going to do? Hard act to follow. Okay, so um, I'll keep it brief. So what can I do? Um, I mean, we have a responsibility when, when we have invested in, in new medicines to do our best to get them reimbursed and out to the people who need them. That's one of the key things. The second thing, it sounds simple, but it's around then educating healthcare professionals about those treatments, because they're the individuals that have those discussions with people who may benefit. Um, and then the third is um, around continuing to be a bit pushy. So I see sometimes that there are disparities in terms of access. Um, and obviously I'm talking about treatments here, but actually how do I raise that amongst my team, amongst my network, um, because actually there, there are differences around the country. And I suppose last but not least, we always try to be a partner um, where we can, um, and you've got my commitment that where we can, we will continue um, to, to partner with everyone as much as we can um, in various projects. Thank you. I'm going to do three things. Mm -hmm. I'm going to continue pioneering for excellent research because we need the evidence. I'm going to enhance the number and different ways that I work with different organisations. And across the border in Scotland, we have a very strong track record. And that involves me co-leading Scotland's PrEP strategy with the Chief Exec of Waverley Care. And I'm really proud of that. And I'm going to continue my learning mm -hmm. with the person in front of me, continue to learn about their cultures, continue to tailor. Sometimes that won't involve me asking them about how comfortable their sex life is if it's not right. 
Sometimes that will involve me asking them really personal questions, and I hope that will be informed by working with many of you with different backgrounds and different experiences. Mm -hmm. And fourthly, I hope I will continue to be humble because this is a big journey for all of us. And for many of us who are going as grey as me, as you rightly said, this has been going on for years. And I want to continue feeling privileged that my career in medicine has let me work with phenomenal people and to get to a point where we could reach transmission elimination. Brilliant. Thank you. James, how about you? Um, yeah, on, on, a, on a personal level, I'll, I'll stick to two or three similar messages. Um, I think I'd like to think that I could continue to inspire uh, others across, you know, certainly across the, the Liverpool city region, Cheshire and Mersey, and, and nationally, uh, and work with other commissioners to, to try and you know, improve services as much as possible. Um, there's something about continuing to challenge stigma on an ongoing basis. Uh, whenever we hear it, we should challenge it. Um, so I will, I will continue to do that and to obviously champion um, good access to testing and PrEP and all the things we talked about earlier and, and that have gone on today. Um, I think the other one is um, very passionate as a public health lead about working with communities on an ongoing basis, listening, understanding, carrying out insight work, reducing barriers. Uh, and I think that's the bit I'd like to make sure that I continue to do on a, on a personal level to go and do some, we've done some great focus group work, we've listened to people, we've carried out insight work based on Combi. Uh, all of that sort of stuff I'd like to continue doing and, and feed that into plans that make a difference to people so that we're doing things that actually um, follow what is wanted and not what we think is wanted. So um, from a personal level, that's, that's certainly what I'll do. Uh, and as I said earlier, probably the additional is to continue with some of the national support for commissioners who might need it. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you. Yeah, I think um, the main thing I'm going to do is, is actually to listen, to listen to, to, to everyone. And if, if anyone has an idea or about the new HIV Action Plan, you are very welcome to email adam.winter at dhsc.gov.uk. <laughs> That's adam.winter at dhsc.gov.uk. You know, I've, there's a perception we're, we're, we're in the department in our ivory tower, but, you know, we, are, we do have email addresses. We even have phone numbers. So, um, and I very rarely get a phone call, actually. So, so yeah, so do, <laughs> do, 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 get, in, do get in touch. Um, I mean, Claudia mentioned humility, and I think that's, that's also really important. I think, you know, I've worked in now HIV. I've been fortunate to work in HIV now for a number of years. And I think, you know, there is, um, for me, a really interesting balance on we need to continue with what is working, but also to get to the, that final couple of thousand people undiagnosed. We are going to have to do new things. So we're going to need to be open to new ideas and to doing things differently. So I think humility is really important. Um, and also another thing for me that's really important is, is candor. You know, we don't have unlimited resources. There may be some things and some ideas that people want to do that, that, that are too difficult to implement, that we, that we don't have resources for right now. Um, so, yeah, so from a national perspective, I want to promise you honesty uh, about that and to kind of engage you in those conversations on prioritisation. Thanks. Thank you. And Richard. And I'm going to do a couple of things that people have mentioned, some that I, I think is important for all of us to take on board. But I suppose, firstly for me, I'm going to ask for more money and of whether it's to fundraise for THT and make sure that we're getting that from private donors and individuals out there that say they support our cause and make sure they do because the freedom to say sometimes the candor back the other way, we can only get because we're funded by the, 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 the community sector. But equally, for this programme that we're in now, when Labour left office, there was in 2021 prices £4 million being spent on what has become HIV Prevention in England, it's now one million. So we have a quarter of the money while trying to find, yes, let, less people, but by definition, the people we keep saying, we need to go to spend more, do more, to make sure we're finding and diagnosing. And I would like to say to our friends in pharma who are lovely and generous, <laughs> like, can we think about, one, looking at the best practice in America, it's one of the things they do get right, is the funding that goes from pharma to the community, but can we move from grants to a strategy for funding the sector? Like this, you know, us yep. spending so much time filling in forms yep. to jump over the hopes on your terms. Like, you've got great budgets you know, on everything else you strategize. On the rest, you let us come with a begging bowl saying, please, can we do this little bit with you? And if we can change that relationship, it might mean you work with less of us, but in really transformational ways for maybe, you know, one going for three years and something. 
So I think we should do that. Um, for me personally, I think um, I have some opportunities because of either where I work and what I've done before to get in the conversation, particularly with the new government, and I want to be committed to not only bringing people living with HIV into those conversations directly, but people who have very different lived experiences to me into those. I think that's a really important personal commitment to make. And then thirdly, to keep taking THT to that place on health equity constantly. It's easy when you want to be the national leading organisation to always go for scale and want to get big numbers, but sometimes there is a, an interplay between scale and equity, and we try and get both right all the time, but I think the most important thing is starting with those who are having the worst outcomes and making sure we deliver from them and work out from that point rather than go to those who might be first at our door and hope we get to the right people at the end of the day. And just, just to round up, I'm gonna, I, so I'm going to say what I, I think I'm going to do. So I'm going to continue to work on the opt-out programme quite clearly. I'm not leaving either. <laughs> uh, and I, I'm, not, I'm not leaving the sector I, because, because I can't. <laughs> but not because I'm physically unable to, but because, I'm, but, I'm, but, because, but because I don't want to emotionally, very clearly. It's, it's, it's because, you know, it took me, you know, 12, 13 years to get involved in HIV at all, and now I'm involved in it, I'm involved till it's finished. <laughs> and I, uh, and that, co that comes, from, you know, I, and going back to what Christina said, I'm able to do that because I have relative status that comes from my class and my positional power and my race and my gender that isn't available to everyone, but this is a plea to everyone in the room. If you, if you have that bit of imposter syndrome, which for some reason I don't seem to have, <laughs> the, uh, the, the, uh, and every, mo I, I believe it is, mo most people do have it. I am here to tell you that this is your space. <laughs> so this is, this is your space. So every, every time you have that thing on your shoulder going, oh no, it's not for me to email Adam. No, it is. Not, not just that. But, there, but, but this, and I, I had a conversation with Liz, about this a while ago, you know, this, sp this space about, oh, I'm not quite sure what to do next, I'm not sure how I can make the difference, or this thing is really bugging me, or this person isn't paying attention, tell them, tell me, if you can't tell them, come to me, you know, my, my email address is i.jackson at nhs.net, it's quite an easy one, and, you know, we won't solve every problem, I can't help with every, every single issue, but there is, a, there is a movement in this space and in this room, and on this panel, and more importantly, on the floor, of people who've got brilliant ideas that will make things better for massive amounts of people, and it is the only space I've ever really been in, this now the hepatitis world, where that actually happens. And it happens because of you, not because of us. So I want you to seize those moments every time they become available to you to go, actually, no, I'm not going to wait for someone else to make a fuss about this. I am going to email the person. You don't have to get your boss's permission to email us. You just, just talk to us. And let's say, we can't fix everything, we, we never will be able to on our own, but actually every single bit of those conversations feeds into the narrative, feeds into the conversation, feeds into the plan, helps us do the research, helps us you know, generate how we behave as commissioners or as you know, pharmaceutical industry colleagues to go, well, actually, the, the big things we need to be able to achieve are X, Y, Z. And if you don't have that conversation with us, it won't play in. So I want you to realise your own power and to keep going with what you're doing, but come out of this with a sense that you do, you are powerful, and you are, more than that, you are mighty. So I want to thank the panel, thank everyone for being here today, and mostly thank you all. So before we head off from the day, I want to thank Ian and all the panel for that amazing last session, for all the speakers from today, for such amazing contributions, and of course, it wasn't just the speech itself, but the work you've done prepping the presentation and the speech stuff, and then of course all the research you've done before that to do the presentation and the speeches. It's been amazing the endeavour we have seen in this room and how this sector is so inquisitive about what works, so determined to focus on health equity, and so striving to meet this amazing goal of being the first virus where we could stop the onward transmission without a vaccine, without a cure, to be the first country to do it and to do all that by 2030. We've seen various things um, said throughout the day, and I think they fall into some important themes to feed back on. Firstly, this bit about equity has been you know, there on every slide going forward. We don't want to end the epidemic for one group or one community, one city, one place. We do it together, and I think it's really important to make that happen, and that when we're doing that work, we're purposefully 
in that space. Secondly, so much of our health service is about the 20% the that is healthcare. What about the 80% that is those social determinants for health? And I think they come up all the time in all of those sessions that really the issue isn't about the medicine. And we thank Vive and Gilead and MSD for giving us the best medicine in the world. But HIV isn't about the medicine anymore. It's about those social determinants of health around it. And that's where we need to be so active in this space. It's where no organization could have a monopoly and it's where we can only make impact if we work together and we see what each of us can bring in different ways. Thirdly, that we today have made a step forward, whether it was the minister announcing that we will have an action plan, that we will revise that data, uh, dashboard data for the country on 1990-90 so that those 14,000 lost to care aren't suddenly deduced to 2% of those diagnosed because those two numbers do not uh, work, and by some of the conversations I have seen happening, and you know, I've seen today me huddling with staff, right, this is an action we need to take forward, and I've seen it with others and other organisations here today. So this conference itself hasn't just been a time to learn and reflect. I keep seeing these huddles of action. This is a, a, a to-do list that many of us have uh, come up with. I'm really lucky to work for an organisation that is so amazing in lots of ways and gets to work with such amazing partners. And I'm very lucky to have that strength in the voluntary sector in the HIV community that have been incredibly supportive of me and the organisations for its time. I have some wonderful staff, many of which are represented here in wonderful T-shirts and, and other things. Uh, Taku has led today and the team on HIV Prevention England so brilliantly. And I know all of you <laughs> enjoy working with him and whether it's uh, Brogan, Thomas, Barry, Joe um, or others in the team uh, that support him as well as the wider THG family together we do that really well and he is a phenomenal thought leader in this space and a man who makes things happen uh, which is the thing I most respect uh, in the world and we couldn't do any of that stuff without our activation uh, partners so thank you very much uh, for all of you being part of making HIV Prevention England a coalition that is so impactful. When I was in one of the sessions, I looked out the window very briefly, and it was St. Thomas's Hospital. And it made me just stop and think for a moment that that is where Terry Higgins died. And that is in many ways where this journey started. And you think the physical distance of how far we've come. And then you think, as Ian has said, really the journey that we have gone on, and the fact that we all are a footnote in various ways in the most remarkable medical journey that has ever happened and the most remarkable turnaround on something that started in such a desperate plight to one where today we have that sense of hope that we could be the first country in the world to end this epidemic. And I suppose the only thing left to say is we can only do it together. I hope you had a really brilliant day. Thank you very, very much. Thank you for being here. And good luck. Take care home. Have a great weekend.